I'm glad to be with you to deal with this text. This is, a, this is really a crucial text. I kind of got introduced it last time. If your Bible has a paragraph that runs from verse 11 all the way to verse 21, that, that's common in most English translations. My New American Standard does not break this at verse 15. But, but many do. And, and here's the issue. Paul is going to bring up that Peter and him had a confrontation. Now the whole purpose of bringing this up is to say Paul is independent. You can't hear? that he is independent of the authority of the Jerusalem 12. It's not that he's mad at Peter. I think Paul and Peter had, had a wonderful relationship. It's this continuing uh, accusation of the Judaizers that Paul has a new gospel, that he's not really an apostle, that he's really dependent on the 12 in Jerusalem. This is an added argument. Okay. Now the question comes... Where does the conversation between Paul and Peter stop? I think verse 14 is the only quote of Paul to Peter. Beginning in verse 15, or at least 16, it looks like Paul is widening the implications of what he said to Peter for the Galatian churches. He did this to Peter. Why? He said this to Peter. Why? There is an implication for all of us from this confrontation. Now I want to remind you what's happening. I have said to you that there are five visits to Jerusalem by Paul recorded in Acts. There are two in Galatians. We're not exactly sure how that fits. It looks to me this is somehow related to the Jerusalem Council of Acts 15. And here's the reason. Paul comes back from the mission field to explain his gospel to the mother church, to the original church. And he does this to get their, not their approval, not that they vote on what he says. He believes God told him. But he wants the church to be one. That's why he took up this offering from the Gentile churches for the church in Jerusalem. He wants the church to be one. So it is very important to him that he somehow builds this bridge. So he wants to fully explain himself. Allow Barnabas, a leader from the Jerusalem church, to explain what they're preaching so that all of the church of Jesus Christ can affirm this is the message. This is the message for Jews. This is the message for Gentiles. This is the gospel. Now, the problem is going to be that Pharisees, as you know, when the gospel was preached, there was 3,000 priests saved. When the gospel was first preached in the beginning of Acts, there were many Pharisees that trusted Christ. But what they're doing, they're bringing their past with them. And they are looking at Jesus through their past experience with Moses. And they are saying everybody ought to come this same way. Now, you know, we're still faced with that today. Uh, all of us found Christ um, in a certain way. And if we're not careful... We make that the way everyone should find Christ. A perfect example is we are a part of evangelical Christianity. We talk about people coming down front to trust Christ. We talk about a sinner's prayer. I assure you there is no sinner's prayer in the New Testament. That was not the way they did it. They didn't have buildings. They didn't walk down front. 
So for us to say you got to walk down front to be saved is to show how we're doing the same thing the Judaizers did. I remember one time there was this uh, radio station, a Christian radio station, now talk radio, which is better, in Dallas. And they, they made the statement that unless you face uh, Jer you know, uh, Jerusalem, you can't be saved. I thought, yuck. Are you telling me that if I don't face the right direction, I can't trust Christ? That's what they were saying. You know, I thought to myself, it'd be just my luck, I'd be facing Carsicana and go to hell. I mean, <laughs> and this same radio station one time said, yes, you must call the name of the Lord. If you don't do it out loud, you can't be saved. Now, that's ridiculous. And then they said, if you don't pronounce his name right, and you call him Jesus, but his name is Yeshua, and if you don't call him by the right name, you can't be saved. Now, see, it's that same tendency that what happened to me, how I experienced God, is what ought to happen to you. Now, thank God that you've experienced God. But friends, your experience is not the standard for everybody. Jesus is the standard for everybody. But how we come to him, there is no standardized form. I'm even amazed at the variety in Acts of, of how people came in different ways and the different things we talk about occurred at, at different points in that experience. The important thing is that we've met Jesus Christ, but the early church is just struggling with this. So a group of leaders came and they, and they came to these Gentile churches. And Peter had been eating with everybody and just having a great old time. And Bubba showed up. And now Peter starts acting like Bubba. And Barnabas starts acting like Bubba. And Paul publicly confronts him. I really think that we ought to confront these problems in private. Amen? It, 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 there's nothing healthy about Showing the dirty clothes to the whole world of the problems we had in church. But Peter did this publicly. And Peter needs to be called out publicly for doing this. And I don't think Paul was ugly or mean. But he goes into a logical argument, a logical presentation of how what Peter did is absolutely contrary to the gospel truths that whosoever will may come through faith alone, by grace alone, in Christ alone, plus nothing. Now, this is a big enough deal that Paul brings it up with the head of the apostolic group. And Paul records the conversation. Paul records it so that the world can see the issue is the gospel. The issue is what is truth. The issue is how does a person made in the image of God Damaged by human rebellion, come back to God and be accepted. Now, that's the issue. And it is a really major uh, bedrock issue for the church to get right. You get, you get this wrong, the rest is wrong. Okay? So that, that's the issue we're talking about. Now, let me begin, if I could, here. In, in verse uh, 15, he's basically saying that uh, the Jews had some advantages. Now, th these advantages are spelled out. I think in a wonderful litany in Romans 9, about verse 4 and 5. They've got the covenants. They've got the patriarchs. They've got the law. The Messiah will come from them. All these benefits. But I will say this. The benefits had nothing to do with salvation. The benefits had to do with revelation. Now think what I just said. Jews are not right with God because they're Jews. Jews are right with God because they have faith in God. Now in the Old Covenant, they didn't know everything about the Messiah we know. Even the, even the Rebel of the um, Genesis 15, 6, it's going to be quoted. Abraham believed God and it was counted to him as righteousness. That had nothing to do with the Messiah. That had to do with the child. And so they believed God's word, took God's word seriously, had a faith relationship with God. That's what makes someone right with God. Not who your family is. Not, not, not what uh, ethnic line you come from. But faith in Jesus Christ. Now, he's going to have to lay that out. Paul is going to have to confront these people's 
trusting in their lineage. Now, I guess for me, the most important text is John 8, 31 through 59. Where John's gospel says, a group of Jews believed in him. Same Greek word is used in our text. But in verse 59, because Jesus confronted them over their racial prejudice, arrogance, exclusivism, they picked up stones and tried to kill the one that 30, verse 31 says they believed in. Now there's the fickleness of human belief. So we've got to try as best we can to figure out what is the basic gospel for all people. If we have five minutes in an elevator with somebody, what do we share? I pray you don't share that we don't spit, dance, or chew, or get tattoos. Please tell me that's not what you share in five minutes. Oh, and, and, and you should smoke, too. Get over it. What is the thrust of the gospel? And you don't wear pants to church. If we had to get down to the nitty-gritty, what is the least that someone can believe and be saved? That's what we're talking about. Not everything we think is fine. Not all our opinions. What is the bare bones, irreducible, non-compromisable minimum of the gospel? Now there's the issue. Now you've got to decide what that is. These Judaizers said it was Moses. There have been many other people that say it's certain kind of experiences, certain kind of rituals, joining the right group, living in the right area, worshiping the right way. But Paul's going to say the essence, the irreducible essence, is personal faith and trust in God's only Son who died on our behalf. Period. End of story. Now the rest we can talk, but that's non-negotiable. That's what this is all about. Now notice, if you would, when he says, and not sinners from among the Gentiles. Now that's a, that's a derogatory phrase. Common in Judaism to talk about what they, what they would call the nations or the goyim or the Gentiles. And when they said it, they would almost spit. I mean, it's that kind of negative statement. So Paul uses their words, their terminology to heighten his argument here. Then verse 16, and I want to take just a minute to read a little bit of my notes because it's a little bit too much for me to just hold in my mind. But I want you to look in your Bible at verse 16, chapter 2, verse 16. There is going to be a threefold parallelism. Now, this is Old Testament thinking, and Paul is doing this for Old Testament people who have missed it. So he's going to present this truth in a three-line balance of two items. Now, now follow with me. This verse contains a threefold emphasis concerning the doctrine of justification by grace through faith alone is for every human being. Beginning with, now here are the three, the three generic references with universal implications. A man, that's generic, a human being. We, now the real, the real hair pull is who does we refer to? Paul and, and the Jewish people. Uh, we Gentiles, all human beings. The real fighter who we is, look at the last one. No flesh. Now the first one was generic. The last one is obviously generic. So I'm assuming the plural pronoun is generic to we human beings. Now, notice, follow with me now. Look, look at verse 16. This threefold repetition is overwhelming in its impact. The truth of justification by faith for all mankind, Jews and Gentiles, males and females, slaves and free, short and tall, bald and unbald, is the same. There's one gospel, one way, one truth. And what is that truth? Look at verse 16. This is really developed in Romans 1, 1 through 8. And what is it? That we are right with God based on, not on what we do, but on what Jesus has done. Now look at, look at the balance. Paul's emphasizing the requirement of justification is not, is not, is not by works of the law, 16a. Not by works of the law, 16b. Since by works of the law shall no flesh be justified. 16c. Okay? How are we saved? What is the gospel? How do people come that are sinful in need? How do they come to God and be accepted? Look at the threefold emphasis. Through faith in Jesus Christ. 16a. 
We have believed in Jesus Christ, 16b. By faith in Christ, 16c. Holy moly, he is just hammering this nail down. We do not come in what we do or don't do. It doesn't matter what you eat or don't eat, what you drink or don't drink, what calendar you have or don't have. It's not human performance. It's a loving God that created us for fellowship with himself. We left him and he's been chasing after us for millennia, millennia. Through our sin, through our rebellion, through our stupidness, through our bad choices, he has been pursuing us. There's an English poem to describe God that has a shocking title. The Hound of Heaven on our trail has our scent. Will not give up. Any moment you'll stop. Any moment you'll stop and say, help me. You'll find there's a still small voice that says, I love you. I want you to know me. I sent my son to die in your place. Trust me. Come to me. I love you. Now that still small voice is a voice for all human beings. And that, that's what Paul is willing to confront Peter, the Jerusalem church, and any false teacher over. And that's the, that's the message when we stand before God and he asks, why should I let you in my heaven? If you say my mother was, my denomination is, I never did that. I never went there. I always, you don't get it. The answer does not start with the singular pronoun I. It starts with the second you. You promised. You sent. You called. It's the grace and character of God that is the only hope for fallen mankind. Now this grace and character of God must be responded to. Here is the dignity of being made in the image and likeness of God. Here is, here is the dignity of the human being where God says, I love you, but I'm not going to kick down the door. I love you. I want you to know me, but you must come to me. Here's who I am. Here's what I've done. Come to me. Come. Don't go to denomination. Don't go to human. Come to me. The gospel is primarily a personal encounter, not a creedal encounter, not a liturgical encounter, not a ritual encounter, but a loving, personal relationship. The Hebrew word no mean interpersonal relationship. God wants to know you. God wants to fellowship with you. And that is that has been damaged and strained and broken by human rebellion. But God has taken the initiative to, to solve that problem. And what is how did he do it? By grace, through faith, for whosoever will. By marvelous truth. And that's the issue. And it, it is a big issue, even today. Now, the word believe is still in verse 16. And I want to do a word study on this. Quickly. And the reason I do this is not to show off that I know what the word means. It's to try to impress you that you cannot read the Bible like the morning newspaper written directly to you. This is not English, and this wasn't written in Louisiana in the 21st century. It's written in Greek, and it's written in the 1st century. And we're a long way from culture and language in the 1st century. So you've got, to, we've got to study the Bible by putting ourselves back in the place of the first hearer. What would they have understood? And I've said it so many times, I want to say it again. The writers of Scripture are Hebrew thinkers writing in the common language of the Mediterranean world. So we have to go back to this Hebrew understanding. What does it mean to believe, trust? In Hebrew, this concept means faithfulness loyalty, dependability. It comes from a person in a stable stance. And then the metaphorical extension occurs. So this is what I've always... And when this truth came to me, it was so eye-opening to me. You see, I've grown up in, a, in, a, in evangelicalism, and, and we talk so much about, oh, when I trusted Christ, I was, I was so happy. I had goosebumps. I came then running, crying. I, was, I had joy. Man, it was great. And thank God for... I, I just thank God for human experience. 
But our hope is not in human experience. Because I see a lot of people jumping in the world religions who I think have no connection with Christ. Humans jump over old movies, jump at weddings, jump at financial, you know, gain. It's not the emotion we bring to this. It's the truth behind this. And what is that truth? It is God's trustworthiness that we trust. It is God's faithfulness that we faith. When it all comes down to it, friends, when it all comes down to it, it's a person we welcome. Come into my life. Come into my heart. It's truths about that person that we accept. Not human discovery. Not that we can explain it all. It's belief that the Bible really is the self-revelation of the one true God. And then after we know him and know about him, we commit ourselves to live like him. This little stool has three legs. It must have three legs. You take one of these legs away, the stool won't stand. Personal relationship, affirm the truths of the Bible, and walk like he walked. Now that's, that's how we know. That's how we come. That's, that's the evidence that we know him. Now Paul is going to develop this, and I must admit to you, there is some real question about exactly what is refer, Paul is referring to through here. Uh, some of us read this and we're saying, now what does this phrase mean? What does that phrase mean? And I, I just admit there's some different ways to take this. The overall, reading the whole paragraph is pretty clear. And that's so true of much of Scripture. We get in the weeds and we never get out of the weeds. Well, every paragraph has one truth. If I ask you to read verses 15 through 21 or 11 through 21 and write one declarative sentence, what is this about? That would be the what we're willing to die for. This, that would be the main issue. So although I cannot follow his argument completely, I don't know exactly what verse 18 is talking about. Is he going back to a previous life? Is he talking about his life in Judaism? Exactly what Paul's thought here is, none of us know. But verse 19 cleans the mess up. And here's the way it cleans it up. For through the law, I died to the law. Now, this is talking about, Paul develops it so much better in Romans 6. That's why I keep saying to you, a reference Bible is a must for a Bible teacher. Because we don't look for parallel passages just to find where the word is used over and over. We are looking for the clearest teaching passage on this subject. Now, when I think about where does the Bible teach that I have died to the law with its implications, it's Romans 6. I mean, Romans 6 is the text. And Paul is saying this. He uses two analogies. In, in chapter 7, he says, here's a married couple and one dies, so the spouse is able to remarry. The law died, and I can now, quote, marry again to the gospel. But that's the analogy. The other one is when we baptize somebody. Buried with the swami do immersion. Buried with Christ in baptism, right? We died with him. Now, if we died with him, we're also raised with him to walk in newness of life. So the implication is, Paul is saying, I used to think I came to God by this road. It was what I did, what I didn't do, my sincerity, my, my zeal. And boy, Paul knew about zeal for the law. But he found that with all that zeal, and many of us speculate that after hearing Stephen's sermon in Acts 7, if Paul's mind started thinking through what he had always heard and always been taught, we wonder if God prepared him for that Damascus Road experience at the stoning of Stephen that's recorded in Acts. But finally, Paul was willing to say, now he puts it in crude language, everything I thought was good before is nothing but a rubbish heap comparison to Christ. All that I thought would get me there and keep me there and all that I thought would impress God and all that I thought made me really somebody, I count as loss, as nothing. To know Him. To know Him. The essence of Christianity is a personal relationship. That personal relationship comes by the initiation of God, the death of Christ, and the wooing of the Holy Spirit. And all we do is respond. There are only two kind of people in the world. Those who responded and those who have not responded. 
But there's all kind of maturity levels among those who've responded. There's all kind of evil levels among those who haven't responded. There's only two kinds of people. Those who've responded and those who have not responded. Now once you see it that way, it breaks down all the human barriers between human beings, including the main barrier of the first century, which was Jew and Gentile. I don't know what barrier may be today, but it, it, it's gone in Christ. Now verse 20, what a wonderful text. You know, when I read verse 20, my mind goes to Romans 12, 1 and 2. Because we're talking about the same kind of thing. And I don't know what, I don't know what terminology to use except death to self. Now, I don't mean that death to my personality, death to my call and giftedness. Because I think that's, that's part of who God made me to be. I, I really want to affirm Psalm 139 that we're created as we are. To serve, serve God. What I need to give to him is that part of me that longs for the things of the world. That part of me that says, do it for yourself. Do it because it feels good. Do it because you want to. More and more for you at any cost. Now, I've got to die to that. That call for me and mine and more and now, that's the call of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. That is the broken image of God. And how do I know I've been saved? Because I walked down front? Because I had an emotional experience? No, no, no. I think all that's important and crucial. But the way I know, the evidence that I've met him is, now I care about you. Now I care about how I live. Now I, I don't want to offend you. Now if I offend you, I need to make it right. Um, there's a pull for others. There's a pull away from what's in it for me to what's in it for the body of Christ. We are saved to serve. We are saved for the health and growth of the body. It's not about me anymore. It's about us. It's a family deal. And our big brother is the head of the family. It's so hard for Americans to think with this family, tribal emphasis because we're so ingrained with, with individualism. But these, the New Testament is a corporate. I am crucified with Christ. Now, what does that mean? Is that some kind of mystical experience? I think we're talking about the law. Now, make this note. And I want you to write this down if you don't have my notes on Galatians. You can get them free online if you want them. At verse 20, Paul uses the term crucified. Now, here's the two texts I want you to look at. Chapter 5, verse 24, and chapter 6, verse 4. Paul uses the word crucified in relation to a believer's relationship to the fallen world system. 524, 64. Here, it seems to be the believer's connection to the law, just like chapter 3, verse 13. Paul is not a systematic theologian. Oh, to God that Paul uses words the same. He does not. The big turkey does not do that. I remember the first book I read. It's my favorite book on Paul. It's, it's by a man named James Stewart. A Man in Christ by James Stewart. And for the first time, I saw a scholar lay out for me Paul's different uses of the word mystery. Paul's different uses of the word hope. Paul's different uses of the word crucified. And suddenly it became so obvious that you've got to interpret words by context and not by a dictionary. What we tend to do is put a technical definition on a word and then use that technical definition every time the word appears. And when you come to Paul, it's a disaster because the man doesn't use the word consistently. Thirteen uses of the word mystery. Here's at least two of the word crucified. Context determines meaning. Context determines meaning. Words only have meaning in a sentence. Sentences only have meaning in a paragraph. But see, we don't think that way. And suddenly we lock down our theology based on preset technical definitions. Most of the time on English words. And we never even check the context. You say you fussing? Yeah. Yeah. We're terrible interpreters of the Bible and we'll club each other over our interpretations. Amen or oh me. I always get tickled in a class when a student who's not yet 15 years old knows what the Bible says. I had a professor in seminary one time. Some student got his case and he said, son, 
I didn't say you didn't know what it meant. I just said I didn't know. That's a great answer. You know, only, only the young and the gung-ho know what everything means. And then life comes. Marriage comes. Children come. The church comes. And suddenly you go, whoa, whoa. <laughs> it's not that easy. It's not that clear cut. We're going to be held account for what we believe the Bible says and how we walked in it. But some of us are going to see some of this a little different way. Amen? It's a pitiful amen. But, sorry. <laughs> but Christ lives in me. Now, what is the deal in that? Could this be the doctrine of the indwelling of the Holy Spirit? Yes, it could, but really it's not. This is not Paul. See, what we do is we want to talk about who indwells the believer. So we jump to all these proof texts that, well, the, the, Jesus is here, the Spirit is here, the Father is here. That's not the point. What is the point here? I have died to the world. I have died to the flesh. Now, because I'm dead to the world, now, I don't live for me. Now I can live for him. Now it's Christ in me, the hope of glory, Colossians 1, 27. It's a new life. It's a new focus. It's a new worldview. Everything changes. Old creature, new creature. That's the idea here. Not systematic theology on who dwells who. And I live by faith. Now, remember? Faith and belief are exactly the same Greek word. It's, it's just different uses. What, what do we mean by faith? And, and I've tried to put this. It's a personal relationship. It's truths about that person. And it's a life like that person. Now, it looks like to me here, it could be several of those. Do we live out of this personal relationship? Yes. Do we live out of this doctrinal truth? Yes. Do we walk in such a way? We try to walk in such a way. Lord, what's your will from this situation? What, Lord, what, what do you want in my life? Informed by Scripture, Lord, how should I respond? I remember years ago I got a record by Billy Graham. It was on a 78, and that tells how old it is, right? Christmas record. And this lady, one was on Lawrence Welk Show, sang this song. When my human nature shouts the thing to do. Now see, I know that when that human nature shouts... God's will is probably the opposite direction. And yet that voice of who I am is pretty loud in my head. For I even think I'm already doing what that voice says. That's why more and more the scripture has to mold me. My trust in him has to mold me. Walk in the light as he is in the light has to mold me. Walk worthy of the calling wherewith you've been called has to mold me. And others will know the difference. Others will know the difference. He loved me and delivered himself up for me. This is substitutionary atonement. This is the idea, sacrificial system. What is Leviticus 1 through 7 all about? Why build a tabernacle? How does a sinful person approach a holy God? God gave them a, a metaphor, a symbol, a, a, a ritual to demonstrate this. Here is a sinful group of people, particularly the day of atonement, Leviticus 16. Two goats. One is driven off and it's supposed to symbolize sin being born away from the camp. The other dies on the altar. Sin costs. Sin always costs a life. But that innocent animal can take away the non-premeditated sins of a whole nation. So when John the Baptist saw Jesus, John 1, 29, and his disciples, Peter was one of them, behold the Lamb of God that takes away the sin of the world. What are we talking about? A lamb died. The world can be right. It's Isaiah 53. All of us like sheep have gone astray. Each of us have turned unto his own way. But the Lord has caused the iniquity of us all to fall upon him. By his stripes we are healed, forgiven, restored. Renew the image that's damaged is brought back into full functioning fellowship again. What, what great truth is this? Now Paul's going to close this last section. Notice this little phrase. If you can be right, that's first class conditional, soon to be true. Paul's going to make a strong statement here. This, this is not going to be true to reality. But he's saying if you suppose that, okay, if you can be right with God through the law, then Christ died needlessly. If anybody can come to God on merits, then we don't need a Savior. The truth is only one 
ever came to God on merits. And he laid down his life, not for his own sin, but for the sin of the whole world. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son, that whosoever believeth in him should not perish, but have everlasting life. God took him who knew no sin, made him to become sin, that we might become the righteousness of God in him. Can you imagine what God must think when we stand before him and say, well, I, I think I've been pretty good. You know, I've been helpful to people. I give to causes. I don't beat my wife up. I vote. I don't run stop signs. Here we're doing. We're telling God what a good deal he got when he got us. There's no way to be saved unless you come to him with empty hands so he can fill it with who he is. You have nothing to commend yourself to God. Isaiah is so strong. It says, your righteousness is as filthy rags before the Holy One. Your only hope to be holy is to be holy as a gift from Him. We call it imputed righteousness. Let me pray. I don't think anybody in this room, Lord, would think that, uh, that we were okay. I think all of us experience lostness, brokenness, separation. All of us feel fear. All of us wonder about the future, wonder about what we've done, choices we've made, people we've hurt, things we've done, things that people have done to us that have damaged us. And yet you come to us with a message about you, primarily about you, and you ask us to come to you freely, fully, and be really accepted. Man, it's hard to accept that, Lord. We want to help you some way. We, 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 we want to participate some way, and all we can do is receive. I pray today that the, the basics of the gospel become clearer and clearer to everyone here, that we might truly trust in what you've done, who you are, and not in what we've done and who we are. And that when we share you, we don't share ourselves. We don't share our personal understanding. We don't share our personal preferences. We don't share our denominational uniquenesses. We share these basic truths of the gospel. Hopeless, hope, whosoever. Lord, thank you for these great, great inclusive words. Thank you for a sacrifice as wide as the world. Thank you for an invitation as wide as...